Hey, Cypher here. I'm putting this thing together quickly, hopefully not too late, but I hope this helps with the whole political mess that has happened with recent protests. You know, with the taking a knee during the singing of the national anthem. Heck, I don't care much about sports in general, but there is an interesting thing that is missing in the rhetoric surrounding all of this. Context. Something I don't hear is the history behind the protests in American sport, because this is by no means a new phenomenon. Now these recent protests take place during the singing of the Star Spangled Banner, or the National Anthem, whatever you want to call it, during the beginning of football games. So we might as well start with where that tradition came from. The first time that the National Anthem was sang during the beginning of a game was actually in a baseball game in 1897. Though it wasn't quickly adopted, it was steadily, and had become somewhat of a tradition by the end of World War I. The first time I could find where protest was actually considered for political usage in American sports was in 1936, where the US actually contemplated boycotting the Olympics because of, well, the Nazis. The Olympics will come up again, but if you're interested in a more detailed analysis of that stuff, I actually made an episode a while back about Olympic history. But really the time that protests started sneaking into American sports was during the 1960s. From 1964 onward, it was actually a regular sight to see fans not standing for the national anthem because of the Vietnam War. But those were fans, not players. But in 1965, a new component of this kind of protest came about. 21 players boycotted the American Football League's All-Star Game because of racism they had been facing in the place that the game was being played. Uh, one guy yelled out, you, you, you so-and-so-and-so's get off the street. John F. Kennedy is not playing in here tonight. Pulls out a gun. You are not coming in here and they decided just not to play if they were going to face that kind of racism. So by 1965, protests on behalf of race relations were already a facet of football. And that would spread to a whole bunch of other sports, including boxing. A couple of years later, Muhammad Ali, a boxer, had changed his religion to Islam. That changeover was somewhat related to his race because that was part of the black power movement. Are the Muslims taking no, you for a ride? No, the white people have been taking us for a ride for the past 400 years in America. And the Muslims are straightening me up and teaching me the truth and saving my life. That year, he was also drafted to go to Vietnam, but he dodged the draft on religious grounds. Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, refused to take the American army oath. He maintains that his religion won't allow him to kill people of his own color in Vietnam. I will say here boldly now on television, no. I will not go 10,000 miles from here to help murder and kill another poor people simply to continue the domination of white slave masters over the darker people of the earth. And was penalized for it, even having his boxing title stripped from him. The following year, in 1968, the most iconic protest in sports history happened. After winning first and third place medals at the Mexico City Olympics, two men raised their black gloved fist during the playing of the national anthem. This was extremely controversial at the time, because the raised fist was actually a symbol of the black power movement. But these iconic protests continued. The following year, in 1969, a group of 14 students were banned from the University of Wyoming's football team for refusing to play against Brigham Young University. They were called the Black 14. And the reason why they refused to play against BYU was because BYU was actually a pretty close affiliate to the Mormon Church, and at the time, the Mormon Church was forbidding all black members from the priesthood. The Black 14 raised significant awareness about this whole problem which the Mormon Church finally relinquished its racist policy in the mid-1970s. So these protests can have significant effect. That same year, in 1969, Kurt Flood sued the Major League Baseball Association. He was being traded to another team, and he didn't want to be traded. But due to his contractual obligation, called the Reserve Clause, he was being forced to, or else he would be fired. This actually went all the way to the Supreme Court because Flood was saying that the Reserve Clause essentially made him what he called a well-paid slave. 
uh, a well-paid slave is nonetheless a slave. And therefore a violation of the 13th Amendment. But the Supreme Court did not see it that way, simply a violation of his contract if he refused. This reserve clause is actually pretty common throughout all of American sports, but because of Kurt Flood's protests and suing and all of that, and increasing pressure from the media, Major League Baseball adopted a six-year term in 1972, meaning after six years of being under the reserve clause, a player could become a free agent. Most of American sports had adopted this free agency clause by the 1990s. Another significant event that happened in 1972 was the first Major League Baseball strike. It was over raising pensions and overall pay. There would be a total of eight baseball strikes, mostly because of pay-related reasons. Those eight are in 1972, 1973, 1976, 1980, 1981, 1985, 1990, and 1994 to 1995. In fact, the 1994 to 95 one halted an entire season of baseball. But if you think protesting an entire season of baseball away is particularly troublesome, it was fairly benign compared to what happened in 1980. The Summer Olympics were going to be held in Moscow, but a year prior, the Soviets had invaded Afghanistan. So the US took the lead in boycotting the entire Summer Olympics. And I have notified the Olympic Committee that with Soviet invading forces in Afghanistan, neither the American people nor I will support sending an Olympic team to Moscow. Many other nations joined in. In fact, a hasty boycott game was organized in Philadelphia called the Liberty Bell Classic. The Classic was obviously hampered by the fact that a good chunk of the world was going to Moscow, but it is probably the biggest protest in sports history. Of course, four years later, Russia would return the favor, when Warsaw Pact countries refused to go to Los Angeles in 1984. But Olympic boycotts are a little too big because they're actually sanctioned by the entire nation. Even though we saw a lot of stuff in the 1960s around protest, it did kind of die down during the 70s and 80s. Even throughout most of the 90s, although in 1996, one player for the Denver Nuggets was suspended for refusing to stand during the National Anthem. The National Basketball Association on Tuesday indefinitely suspended Denver Nuggets star Mahmoud Raouf for refusing to follow a rule that players, coaches, and trainers must stand respectfully during the playing of the National Anthem before games. He wasn't doing it on racial grounds, but because of religious motivation. Because he was a Muslim, and what he saw as a tenet of Islam denoted that he couldn't stand during the National Anthem, because it would be false idolatry. So there is precedence for punishing players for refusing to stand during the National Anthem. But that was just one minor incident in the 1990s. It wasn't until 2010, when players started supporting protest movements through their actions during games. That year, the Phoenix Suns wore jerseys saying, Los Suns, in support of immigrants whom they saw as being persecuted. Yeah, last night the Phoenix Suns played basketball and politics. You know, it had to do with Arizona's controversial new immigration law. The National Basketball Association would actually take the lead in sports-related protests for a while. In 2012, a bunch of NBA players showed up to the court wearing hoodies. They were doing so to raise awareness and be in solidarity with what happened to Trayvon Martin. Two years later, many NBA players would do the same thing, this time wearing I Can't Breathe shirts because of footage of Eric Gardner being choked to death by police while he was unarmed. I can't I can't of course, what kicked all of these protests into overdrive was Ferguson, Missouri. That too was because of a police shooting of an unarmed suspect that is regularly interpreted to be racially motivated. This is where the entire national conversation about disproportionate police brutality against blacks came from, and is the origin of the Black Lives Matter movement. All subsequent sports-related protests were in solidarity for that cause. The first was the St. Louis Rams, who entered the field with their hands up, which was directly related to the Ferguson protest chant, Hands up, don't shoot. While the NBA didn't exactly have any controversy around these things, the women's NBA did. Several WNBA players wore shirts that said Black Lives Matter with the hashtag. Many of them were actually fined by the association. The most poignant of these 2014 protests happened in Fontbonne University. 
in the same city that the Ferguson police officer was acquitted. A Knox College basketball player by the name of Ariana Smith walked out on court during the singing of the national anthem with her hands raised. She proceeded to lay on the floor for exactly four and a half minutes. This time was especially significant because Michael Brown, the person who had been shot and killed by the police officer, had been left for dead for exactly four and a half hours. Ariana Smith was actually suspended by Knox College, but that suspension was later rescinded. Now, the Black Lives Matter movement has continued since 2014, but nothing significant in terms of sports history happened in relation to it until Colin Kaepernick. He started his protest, which is continuing to this day, initially by sitting during the national anthem. He has been very clear in stating that it is directly in relation to unequal treatment to black people. You know, this country stands for freedom, liberty, justice for all, and it's not happening for all right now. He did this during the preseason, but after meeting with somebody who had tried out for the 49ers by the name of Nat Boyer, who happened to be a former Green Beret, Kaepernick modified his protest to kneeling during the national anthem to pay homage to the way that soldiers regularly pay homage to their fallen comrades. Nat Boyer saw this as a way of not dishonoring the flag while still continuing the protest. We sort of came to a middle ground where he would take a knee alongside his teammates. Soldiers take a knee in front of a fallen brother's grave, you know, to show respect. And of course, of very recent date, Trump's comments in Alabama about Kaepernick's protests put the protest in high gear. I'd love to see one of these NFL owners, when somebody disrespects our flag, to say, get that son of a bitch off the field right now, out, he's fired. He's fired! Of course, there's some interesting things I want to point out in terms of Trump's involvement with the NFL, because he actually has a long history with them, and not exactly a good one. In 1983, he was a stakeholder to a rival league, so he tried to sue the NFL for monopolistic practices, which of course he lost. And as recent as 2014, Trump was outbid to get the Buffalo Bills. I'm not saying that there's any motivation behind his comments in Alabama relating to these things, but it's interesting to point out. Now Trump and a lot of the pundits who are talking about this protest in a negative light are saying that Kaepernick is doing this in order to protest the national anthem itself. But this is born out of a misconception. Many consider the third stanza somewhat racist. You almost never hear the third stanza since we only sing the first one. But Francis Scott Key, who wrote the national anthem, didn't write it as an anthem. He wrote it as a poem. It was just later turned into an anthem. Something that a lot of people don't realize about the national anthem and Francis Scott Key's poem is that it was written during a siege in the War of 1812. So that rocket's red glare and bombs bursting in air is referring to the British bombardment of that fort. So the third stanza goes, And where is that band who so vauntingly swore that the havoc of war and the battle's confusion, a home and a country should leave us no more? Their blood has washed out their foul footsteps' pollution. No refuge could save the hireling and slave, from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave, and the star-spangled banner in triumph doth wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. A lot of people look at that slave comment and think that it's saying that all slaves should be in a grave. Now, Francis Scott Key was definitely pro-slavery. There's no getting around that. But those lines are not about actual slaves. He is referring to the British forces. So he's saying that the Redcoats belong in a grave. It's not inherently racist at all. Funny enough, the next stanza in that poem gives us the whole In God We Trust. The final lines in that stanza go, And this be our motto, In God is our trust, And the star-spangled banner In triumph shall wave, O'er the land of the free And the home of the brave. So that song's not without controversy, although I gotta say when it was added to our money, it was changed to In God We Trust instead of In God Is Our Trust, for brevity's sake. But in either case, Kaepernick's protest is not about the national anthem itself. It is about the disproportionate police brutality against blacks. So let's calm down with the rhetoric. It is just a protest, and it's not an unpatriotic one. He's no longer just sitting, he's taking a knee, as well as all the other people who have followed his example. 
it's not the most extreme or prominent form of protest we have seen in this regard, and it is somewhat following a tradition. Of course, the National Football League is a private organization, so if the NFL or team owners decide to stop the protest, it is not a challenge to the First Amendment. So if the NFL or team owners decide to crack down, they're well within their rights to do so. Of course, if players continue the protest and get penalized, or whatever, though they must deal with the consequences of their actions, that is well within what Henry David Thoreau called civil disobedience. And so long as you face the consequences of your actions, the protest can go on. It is certainly an American tradition to protest in whatever way possible. And you must remember with a lot of these protests that they were considered extraordinarily bad at the time, and have been reinterpreted as heroic much later. Mm -hmm.